Hello, and thank you for inviting me to talk at the 2021 International Dark Sky Week as one of the special seminars. My name is Nick DePorzio, and I'm going to be talking about your journey to the dark side, dark matter and dark energy in your own backyard. Or hopefully by the end of this talk, I will have helped to demystify these two phrases, dark matter and dark energy, and maybe also have shown you how you could go about uh, learning about these things, observing them for yourself, yourself. More broadly, my goals for this talk are really to just introduce some open questions in physics. The open questions being what is dark matter and what is dark energy? I'd also like to explain what evidence we have, by we I mean the scientists who, who study these questions, uh, what evidence we have to support why we think we need dark matter and dark energy, why we think those things are there. Uh, and talking more about the scientists who study these questions uh, as a living, who are the different kinds of scientists? What are the different roles that they play in trying to come up with answers and learn more about this problem? And finally, I, I want to uh, describe how you could go about getting your own evidence, actually setting something up in your backyard, pointing it at the sky and seeing for yourself a piece of the uh, of the puzzle, a part of the some of your own data that might uh, convince you uh, that uh, these questions that we have are are real. That there's actual um, some actual mystery that needs explaining. But before we do any of that, I thought it would be good to take a moment to introduce myself a little bit more. I am working on a PhD in physics at Harvard University, and the person that I primarily work with is Cora Dvorkin, who's pictured in the top center of, of this photo. And we work in the areas of physics uh, that cover, that span from cosmology to astrophysics to particle physics. And I'll talk about what all those words mean a little bit more uh, later on. And uh, the topics that we really, the, the, I guess the questions that we're primarily concerned with are, um, what is dark matter? What is dark energy? Uh, I've also worked on neutrinos and how we can study neutrinos using cosmology. Neutrinos are a type of, of particle that we know exists, but we still have some questions about. And I've also worked with uh, another professor at Harvard, Lisa Randall, a little bit on uh, black holes and gravitational waves. Now, I said I would describe what the difference between a particle physicist and an astrophysicist and a cosmologist is, and I'm going to add to that list astronomer. What is the difference between a particle physicist, an astrophysicist, a cosmologist, and an astronomer? So starting at the left in my display of pictures, um, a particle physicist is, is, is really a person who is trying to study what matter is made of at its most fundamental scale. What's the smallest building block of matter that we have and how does it interact with the other building blocks? Now, once we have some understanding of what that matter is and how it interacts with other matter, we can start to put it together into systems. When we get to bigger and bigger systems um, and put them systems that live in space like stars or galaxies or black holes or uh, supernovae, um, how these small scale properties, the individual interactions of, of matter translate to large scale behaviors, the sizes of stars, their temperatures, etc. That's more the domain of an astrophysicist. So an astrophysicist will, in, in my definition of it, um, be more focused on individual objects that live in space that we study with uh, telescopes, for example. But the person who is actually building the telescope and operating the telescope and collecting the data is not necessarily uh, the astrophysicist. 
Um, if you are a person who, whose work is primarily that, building a telescope, operating it, collecting data, um, understanding that data, uh, and relating it back to um, the questions that we're interested in, uh, you, you might be an astronomer. I would, in my definition, is, is more of an astro what an astronomer is. And then the last category is cosmologist. And where the astrophysicist just studied individual um, bodies in space, the cosmologist is more of a person who studies at the largest scales, the largest scales in time and the largest scales in space, how all of the matter and energy in the universe evolves. So not just stars and galaxies, but all of the stuff that acts like light and all of the stuff that acts like matter and particles that we can touch and feel. Um, how do the populations of those two things change over very long times? And these people, cosmologists, are the ones who study the, I would say, the history of the universe. What happened in the past and what is going to happen as we go forward in the future uh, is a cosmologist, is a cosmologist. So I suppose this is just my way of saying that trial and error is just an unavoidable part of learning something new and not to be discouraged by it. Uh, with that said, I thought I would start the main part of this talk by uh, kind of a, an overview of what the state of knowledge in physics is. And the way that our knowledge is kind of clumped is into these four different regimes. In one regime, uh, we consider things that are, uh, they're big and they are, they're slow. So these are, this is like the everyday world we encounter. We, we can see objects and touch them and pick them up and um, they're, they're, they're moving at speeds that are perceivable by eye. Uh, these are planets in orbit. And when we're in this regime, the type of physics that we apply is called classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, you can derive basically how everything will operate from one equation, which is Newton's equation, F equals ma. So that works great until we either start to go really small or we start to go really fast. If we start to go really small, then we move to the bottom right corner of this diagram and the, the, a new uh, regime of physics, uh, we're operating in a new regime of physics that needs a new equation to describe it. This new regime of physics is called quantum mechanics and the equation that governs how things operate is the Schrodinger equation, which is at the bottom of the slide here. Now, if instead of going really small, we kept things large, but made them start to move fast or be very large with lots of gravity, then the regime of physics that we're in now is called general relativity. General relativity isn't governed by the Schrodinger equation or by Newton's equation. It has a new equation that governs how everything works called the Einstein field equation. So those three have kind of defined uh, how we understand physics um, for almost all of the history of physics. And it's only in the past uh, few decades that we've really started to reach into the, the, this new regime uh, called quantum field theory. The idea here is we want to look at objects that are not just small or not just fast, but are both small and fast. And uh, in, in this regime, we, we use uh, something called the, the action to describe how things operate. And this is really kind of where modern physics is, is in this top right part of the plot. Um, trying to figure out how quantum field theory works, how things work when they go really small and really fast. Um, but with that said, there are still some open questions in, uh, in general relativity and in quantum mechanics that uh, we don't even need to talk about this quantum field theory stuff to uh, understand. 
And dark matter is is really one of these problems. Um, the first evidence that we had for dark matter really came from studying things that were big and, and moving slow. This, this came from studying how objects orbit each other. In the big and slow regime, we can just use Newton's law. Um, we have F equals MA, and we also know how uh, gravitationally uh, different bodies attract each other. This is the F is equal to minus G, which is just a number times the mass of the one object times the mass of the second object divided by the distance between those objects squared. And with just these two equations, we can come up with, uh, a, with a prediction for what the orbit of uh, some small uh, object around a much larger object should look like. If no, nothing else is there, if there are no other forces involved, there's no other bodies that are trying to push or, or pull or or anything else on this small object orbiting around a bigger object, then we know exactly where it should be at all points in time, points in time, points in time. So working out this plot, studying what these galactic rotation curves actually look like and finding out that they don't match what we expect them to is work that was carried out over the course of the 1900s. And uh, there's lots of different evidence that we have for dark matter, all of them coming back to this same, um, the same observation that we see something, we, there's something that's interacting, it seems only gravitationally with all the stuff we can see, but in no other way. Another uh, example, another piece of evidence is this, uh, this, this top photo is a photo of the, the bullet cluster. In this photo, you can see all of the, uh, the, the, bullet, the bullet cluster is actually two, um, two masses that are colliding together. And the, the light that you can see here, the, the purple is all the visible matter um, in those two systems. But if you look at light from behind that system, traveling nearby it and coming to us, we see the, the light actually bends. And this is an effect that comes from general relativity in that massive things with gravity can actually bend the paths of light. And we can use information about how much those, uh, those light, those, those photons are, are bending um, to understand how much mass is actually there. And the weird thing is when we look at this, this, this system, this bullet cluster, um, we make a map of all the visible stuff, which is the picture you're seeing. But when we do this thing, tracing the light that's bending, we actually see something that looks like there's mass all around these, the, this cluster. And again, we say that this is, this is an example of, uh, of a problem that seems like dark matter, the stuff we call dark matter, could be the solution to. But the problem is we need to figure out what the dark matter is. We don't know if that is the answer, we, we should be able to observe it in some way to make it or see the products of it uh, interacting with, with something in some other way besides just gravitational. So with a little bit of the background on dark matter out of the way, I wanna make sure that we kind of um, focus in on how we could actually go about observing this stuff or, or coming up with some uh, way of seeing some sign of, of this same signal that convinced the scientists that uh, there was dark matter in the first place. Now, in the last photo of the Milky Way that I showed, there were all of these stars um, arranged and they actually form bands, spiral bands that come around the center of, of the galaxy, of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And between all of these stars, there is hydrogen gas. Um, the important thing to know about this hydrogen is that it's basically a, a proton, which is one kind of particle, and an electron, which is another kind of particle bound in an orbit. They are bound into a, a, an atom. Each one of these subatomic particles, the proton and the electron, has a spin. And it's just an arrow, basically. Um, 
and they can point up or, or they can they can point down and the two configurations that you can have this hydrogen in is when one where they both point in the same direction and one where they point in opposite directions and the energies between the first version where they're in the same direction and the second version where they're in opposite directions are slightly different the energies are slightly different so sometimes this hydrogen will randomly switch from one configuration to the other configuration and the energy the change in energy that happens um, gets put into light into a little particle of light that goes shooting away from this hydrogen atom whenever this transition occurs. This, uh, this is, happens everywhere in the galaxy. And it's such an important process that we actually had it engraved onto this disc uh, that was placed on the, 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 Voyager, uh, the Voyager probe uh, and sent off into to space. And the idea was that this would communicate um, some amount of information uh, concerning like what we know as as humans to any other intelligent being that might come across this this uh, this uh, vehicle. But we are going to be using this uh, this twenty one centimeter hyperfine transition of neutral hydrogen to actually study where all of the matter is in the galaxy around us, us. Now, I said all of the energy from that transition gets packaged into a photon, which is just light um, when this transition happens. And light is defined by uh, the property, uh, a property called its wavelength, or alternatively, its frequency. The idea is just like, like waves in water, um, you can measure what the distance between the tops of the waves are. And that can be smaller or that can be wider. And this quantity we call the wavelength. And for light, different wavelengths correspond to um, one different colors. So red light has longer wavelengths than blue light. Um, but it can also, if you keep you know, stretching out this thing further and further, we just call this light different names, mostly because we can't see it anymore. Um, and light that has been uh, stretched out so that it is 21 centimeters between the tops of the waves, um, that's the kind of light that comes out from this transition of, of, of hydrogen, this neutral hydrogen hyperfine transition. What's really cool about this is um, different types of light get absorbed or scattered or reflected by our Earth's atmosphere. So if we want to see uh, different kinds of light from the ground, we have to check whether or not it's going to be absorbed by the atmosphere. So in the case of 21 centimeter light, you can see on the bottom of this little figure is a scale that's saying, uh, the wavelength of light and the brown is telling you where the atmosphere is blocking or scattering um, light. So in the case of 21 centimeter light, we're lucky because it goes all the way through the atmosphere. The atmosphere doesn't interact with it hardly at all. And we can see that light really easily from the ground. So we can see radio waves really well on the ground on Earth. And um, likewise, uh, the radio waves at 21 centimeters don't really interact with much of anything as they travel through the galaxy. So in a lot of ways, we get an almost uninterrupted signal um, straight from wherever one of these hydrogen transitions happens all the way to our uh, telescope on Earth that's looking at, at that light that light. All right, so our goal here is to try and reproduce on our own the plot that I showed earlier, which was showing what the velocity of matter looks like as a function of how far away from the galactic center you are. To do that, 
we need to do um, we need to do really one thing. We need to point in a direction of some matter and figure out how fast it's going. Um, the information that we kind of are going to take advantage of here is the fact that wherever there's matter, um, there's going to be some of this hydrogen gas that's randomly going through this transition that shoots off 21 centimeter radio waves. So if we can point our telescope in the direction of some mass and measure this radio wave, the radio waves coming from that direction, then we can learn something about the matter um, that, that emitted the, those radio waves. So our goal is we want to make a radio antenna. And I, I realize that there is some irony here that I am giving a talk at a, at a, at a dark sky um, week celebration and am advocating that people go and think about radio astronomy. But, uh, you know, it's, 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 I don't know if it's something people will ever think about. And there's so much physics that we've learned from radio astronomy uh, it, that I was totally surprised that when I found out that you could build um, something very, very cheaply and actually see some of these results for yourself. So um, I wanted to, you, I, you know, if you're here, it's because you enjoy looking out uh, into the cosmos and seeing all the stuff out there and learning about it. And I'd like to think that there's something appealing about looking at a signal that tells you about all the, the universe around you, even if it means you don't uh, necessarily get a pretty picture at the end. So um, if that is appealing to you, well, the good news is it's, it's something that's really easy to do, actually. So um, radio telescopes, really their goal is um, that the bigger that you can make your collecting dish, um, your collecting area, um, the dimmer the object you can see, just like with a normal telescope. Um, and these are just a few examples of, of telescopes, uh, radio telescopes that exist or have existed. Um, they can look like these, these horn uh, shaped telescopes at the top or these big parabolic dishes. Um, at the end of the day, what they're doing is just reflecting light in the form of radio waves to some receiver. So in the parabolic dishes, the receiver is um, the thing suspended on, on the on the tripod and in the horn antenna, it's just reflecting into this uh, waveguide that um, that it guides the light into a receiver. But if you want to see radio waves for yourselves, you don't need to build any big elaborate um, machines because again, there's so much hydrogen that you're not looking at a dim signal. You're actually looking at a very bright signal, and so you can make something as simple as uh, some sheet metal uh, connected into some funnel shape leading into a paint can. And that's exactly what this, this photo at the bottom is. And that can be your collection device that you use to measure radio waves, radio waves, radio waves. Now, I was about to go um, through the process of writing a whole document um, that would coach you through how to go about like setting this up um, and, and conducting this experiment to measure these radio waves. Uh, but then I, I, you know, upon searching around found that there is actually a lab manual that's put out by MIT. This is their, their one of their junior labs called 21 centimeter radio astrophysics. And I put the link here um, for anybody who's really interested in going through the process of constructing one of these telescopes for yourselves and collecting data. And honestly, this isn't the only one. I was, I was surprised to find there are a lot of do-it-yourself radio astronomy guides on, on the internet, on the internet. internet. With that said, I, I still haven't told you how we're going to learn something about the matter from measuring these radio waves. The idea is this, if we are the yellow dot here where the sun and the galactic center is at the middle of this whole spiral object, uh, we can point our radio telescope in different directions 
And notice this, as we point in different directions, there's more or less stuff between uh, along our, our line of sight. The, the, the tricky thing that you have to keep in mind here, which is the trick we're gonna take advantage of to, to answer our question is as we point in different directions, the stuff that we're looking at is moving towards or away from us at different speeds. Now, if you do some clever geometry, you can find out exactly what those speeds are relative to us or for that object relative to the center of the galaxy. And that's exactly what we're trying to figure out. We're trying to figure out what the velocity is of that stuff relative to the center of the galaxy. So we can point our telescope in some direction and we can know what the angle between the center of the galaxy and that direction is. And we still need to find out one more piece of information, which is how far or how quickly that thing is moving towards or away from us. The way we're gonna find out that information is through an effect called the Doppler shift. The idea is that if you have some object that's emitting waves, if it's moving towards you while it's emitting waves, those waves get squished together versus if the object's moving away from you while it's emitting those waves, those objects look spread further apart from your perspective. So translated back to light, if we squish down the wavelength of light, the light goes to higher energies. And if we stretch out the wavelength of light, the light goes to lower energies, to lower energies, lower energies. So then the idea is, if we have all of this hydrogen all over the place that's emitting 21 centimeter light, it will look slightly less than 21 centimeters or slightly more than 21 centimeters based off how fast that object mass where the hydrogen was is moving towards or away from us. So then knowing the angle between the galactic center and that object and how fast the object is moving towards or away from us, we can translate that into how fast that object is rotating around the center of the galaxy. And that's what we were trying to find out, to find out. So given the amount of time here, I unfortunately can't go through all the different steps you would do to actually carry out this experiment, but I can at least outline them. Um, the idea is that you need to build some collecting device. You need to build your telescope, whether it be a horn or a dish type setup. You need to build some electronics, or you can buy them, to actually um, receive the radio signal uh, and, and convert it into an electronic signal. Then you need to go through the process of characterizing this telescope you, you've built. Some of the beam properties of the telescope, for, for example, and figuring out uh, some calibration procedure. Maybe you have some way of producing a radio wave of some known uh, frequency, and you can make sure that when you point your telescope at that object, it actually tells you the frequency that you know um, that, that your test thing is emitting at. And then you need to just, I mean, you, you need to figure out if there are any other signals around that could be interfering with the one that you're trying to see. So you need to characterize this background. You need to measure it with your calibrated telescope. Um, and then after doing all of those things, you can go through step-by-step uh, step, all the different locations in the sky, all the different uh, galactic longitudes, um, point your telescope at that longitude and measure the signal you, you for some uh, set exposure uh, and, and get something that looks like a, a peak in, um, uh, you, you'll get something that looks like a, uh, your, your, antenna temperature as a function of frequency. So you'll see a plot that looks like um, frequency on the bottom and your antenna temperature as the y-axis. And that frequency will be, uh, the data will be peaked around 
um, the frequency that corresponds to light with 21 centimeters. The idea is that if the objects are moving towards us, that frequency will be actually slightly higher. And if those objects are moving away from us, that frequency will actually be a little bit lower. And so using that location of where the peaks in your data are, you can find out how fast um, the stuff is moving towards or away from us, and then calculate how fast they're moving around the galaxy as a result of that measurement. And then um, with, with some raw number in hand, you need to do some corrections to it. Um, namely, our, our, we're moving um, uh, with respect to our, our solar system, for example, and that velocity you need to um, subtract out from, from this, uh, this new velocity that you got, the velocity of that far away stuff relative to us. So if you actually go through and do this, um, you might end up with something that, that looks like this. The idea here is that each one of these curves corresponds to a different longitude that you've pointed your telescope at. And what you're seeing, wherever there's a peak, each one of those peaks is corresponding to a chunk of matter moving at some velocity. So if you see some of these plots, like um, number 75, look like they have two peaks. And the idea here is that there's one chunk of matter close to you moving at one speed, and slightly farther away, there's another chunk of matter moving at a slightly different speed relative to you. Um, and what you're seeing here are actually the arms of the galaxy. So you're seeing some of the hydrogen in the one arm then some empty space and another arm, because we, we're in a spiral galaxy of, of matter that is moving at a slightly different velocity. And with that in hand, you have everything that you need to recreate this plot. Uh, we can, you can look up the equations that you need in the guide, for example, that I posted to convert your measurements of those peaks into uh, velocities as a function of the distance from the center of galaxy. And you should be able to put some of these blue dots that you see on this plot, uh, make, make them for yourself and see that what we expect from just normal Newtonian mechanics does not line up with what we're actually seeing. And so there, it, there seems to be some other gravitationally interacting stuff that we need to explain. And that's what we call dark matter. So now we can move on to our next mysterious stuff, which is dark energy. Now, I've written a bunch of equations on this slide. None of them are important. All that I wanted to do here was us uh, would show that that in if we're working in general relativity, which is the top left of that slide from that I showed earlier, the equation that governs everything, this Einstein field equation, is this first long equation I've written. And the only thing that you that's important to know about it here is just that it relates how space changes and and stretches and shrinks in response to some energy being present. So the left side of this equation is talking about space and what it looks like. And the right side is talking about energy and where energy is located at and how it's, what kinds of forms it's in. If we plug in what we know about uh, the universe into this equation, it, it gives us some information about how space should be expanding and, and contracting in the universe. And that's what this second equation is trying to tell us. It's saying for these different types of energy that exist, one is radiation, one is matter, there are others. Each one of those types of energy 
uh, changes how how the uh, universe stretches or, or contracts with time. So the stretching and contracting is described by this H, and the the Z is our is a is a way to measure time. But the only really important thing um, that I want to pull out from this is that the the units of this quantity, this stretching and contracting thing, the units are kilometers per second. Kilometers per second, that's a distance divided by a time. So it's a speed, it's a velocity. So it's kilometers per second, velocity, divided by megaparsecs. Megaparsecs is just a unit of distance. So we have a velocity divided by a distance. So what this is saying is for every megaparsec away you go, this is how space is stretching. This is the speed that space is, is moving at. So this is, this is an equation um, that we can, we can measure something about. We can make a prediction with. We can say if we know how much of all this stuff there is, and I look this far away, how fast should things be moving? So before even really talking about what dark energy is or introducing dark energy, I want to think about how we could actually go about measuring those two parts of that equation I showed. How we could go about measuring the velocity of some object out in space and how we could go about measuring the distance to that object out in space. Now, in terms of the, the distance part, um, one way we can go about inferring the distance to an object is by looking for, um, for a, a type of star, a variable star called a Cepheid. The variable just means that its, its brightness changes with time, it fluctuates. And uh, the, if it's a Cepheid, that means that we can actually relate how bright this object is, how absolutely, not with respect to us, but you know, if you were there with the, with the star, how bright would it be? Um, to its period of oscillation. So if we can measure the period of oscillation, um, then we can infer from our understanding of how these stars work, how bright it actually is, which we can use to calculate how far away the star is. Based off of the difference really between what we're seeing for the brightness and how bright we know the star actually is and knowing how light uh, disperses as as it travels from from a star. Um, I in in searching around learned that there's a group of people who go about um, doing exactly this uh, as an amateur. Um, there's an amateur astronomy group who who does look specifically at variable stars. This is um, from their website. This animation I took uh, from the American Association of Variable Star observers. And uh, you can see pretty clearly here uh, what I mean by the brightness of, uh, of a Cepheid fluctuating in a periodic way. And uh, to get the distance to it, we measure the period of that brightness. Now, what do we do about the velocity part? Uh, luckily, a lot of the picture that I described in the dark matter situation applies here as well. Um, if we have some stuff, some molecules, some atoms um, that exist nearby whatever object that we're studying, those are all going to be undergoing energy transitions that we might know very well. We might know exactly how much energy changes in those transitions and and thereby we know how energetic the light that they they shoot out um, when those transitions happen how energetic that light is and so just like we were looking at the 21 centimeter line for um, interstellar hydrogen to study dark matter and rotation curves we can look at any of these different um, these different spectral lines that might exist um, for a star 
or for gas around a star or in a galaxy and um, infer how fast that galaxy is moving towards or away from us from how much that line has been shifted. We know what the line should be at because we can even make that stuff here on Earth. We can study um, the molecule in a lab and see exactly what the energy of light it shoots out at is. And we can compare that with um, how much it's been shifted, that energy, um, as a result of the, the star or the gas or whatever it is moving towards or away from us and come up with its velocity. So we have the velocity, have the velocity, have the velocity. Now, it turns out if you want to do this, measure these spectral lines, it's also really um, simple to do. Really, if you have access to any sort of DSLR camera, um, it's as simple as getting something that's going to diffract the light, um, like a diffraction uh, gradient or a, uh, a prism of some sort and um, connecting it to, uh, to this camera and then putting the, um, the, this whole setup uh, into your telescope. So you basically feed um, you know, through maybe instead of an eyepiece, you have your camera there um, with this diffraction gradient, and it will actually measure how of the light, how much of it is at each one of these frequencies. Um, like before, because of time, I, I'm, I can't go through exactly how to do all of this, but I am having done this, have found that if you, if you search for these, how to do this sort of thing, um, online, there are lots and lots of guides that people have have made for doing spectrometry, spectrometry with, uh, with your telescope. Now, if we go ahead and do this process lots and lots of times, we pick objects, we measure how far away they are, we measure how fast that they're moving. Um, we can make this, this table of lots of different values and the part that we're interested in, um, if we're trying to study how the space around us is, is expanding or contracting, we want to plot these velocities divided by the distances. Um, or alternatively, we just plot, uh, we wanna see what, as we go further away, how does the velocity change? So we plot um, the velocity versus the, the position on the x-axis. Position on the x-axis, velocity on the y-axis. Um, and this is actually what was done by um, Edwin Hubble in the first half of the, of the 1900s um, to ultimately reproduce this curve. And the important thing about this is that it's not, well, there's a few important things. Um, one, it's not like flat, it actually curves up. So um, the idea here is that space is, is stretching out. As you go further away, things are moving away faster and, and, and faster. Um, and what was interesting here, um, and this isn't the full picture either, I should say, uh, since then we've, we've expanded this plot out, this plot out further and further and further away so that we can see what this curve looks like even better. And what we found is that if we go back to that equation for how space expands and contracts, what H looks like, um, we find that it, it doesn't work if we just have radiation and matter and dark matter, but we actually need something else. We need something that, that, that changes in a very particular way in that when the space um, gets bigger, like more of it just appears, something that kind of pushes space apart. And we need that to explain what we're seeing in this, in this, in these sorts of measurements as we go further and further away. And this stuff that we've said that we need in order for, you know, this equation of general relativity to be correct, uh, we've called dark energy. So just like before we said, well, you know, our equation could be wrong, but it works in so many situations, in so many cases, 
that if we changed it, we would have to make sure it works in all those other cases and that's extremely hard to do. What's much more likely could maybe be that there's just some other bit of stuff that works the way that we expect it to, but we just haven't accounted for. And that's what we're calling dark energy. So um, with that said, I hope that you've learned uh, at least what these, what some of these words mean, what dark matter is, what dark energy is, what a cosmologist is, an astrophysicist, a particle physicist is. Um, and more importantly, I hope that it was kind of exciting to maybe find out that you can study these things on your own. You can see evidence for these things on your own for really, really cheap. Like anybody could do this in their backyard for maybe a couple hundred dollars, um, which, is, which is super low cost with respect to um, like the, the big observations that scientists are doing uh, professionally. So um, if you wanna see dark matter, build a radio telescope. Uh, if you want to see dark energy, take whatever telescope you've been using and just stick a spectrometer that you have uh, crafted yourself on the end of it and start getting some spectra out. And you can make your own versions of, of the plots that I showed here and you know, make your own evidence for dark matter and dark energy.